Since the 70s, the band Paper Lace has been very special. And Philip Wright has been with that band since they started. And they weren't even called that originally, but he stuck around through thick and thin. He's the drummer and the lead singer of all the great hits, including The Night Chicago Died. Let's do this. Joining me on the phone from jolly old England, Philip Wright from Paper Lace. What part of England are you from? Nottingham. <laughs> I didn't know if you were still there or not. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Born and bred. <laughs> Good. You're like the biggest band to ever come out of Nottingham, I believe. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, there's been nothing since. <laughs> Mind you, Jake Bug, he's, uh, he's from Nottingham. You've heard of Jake Bug? I have heard of him, but I'm not familiar with his material, to be honest. I think you'd like it. Ah, oh, nice. He's pretty um, old school. The thing I wanted to start off with uh, today, Philip, I wanted to, and I'm looking at my notes because we're talking via video, but the radio audience won't know that. So I'm going to refer to my notes. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, condolences and my sympathy. And I speak on behalf of a lot of the fans on behalf of bassist uh, Cliff Fish, who died from cancer on April 14th. That was just a few days ago. So that's still an open uh, wound and a very recent death. Sorry to hear about that about your longtime pal and music um, uh, mate. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I met him when I was 19. Um, it's, a, it's, been a, it's been a long, uh, a long relationship. I, I loved him like a brother. Wow, that must have been devastating. I'm sorry uh, to all his family and fans. We do send condolences from here in uh, Ashland, Oregon, USA. Uh, but he had a long run, didn't he? He had a good. He 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 rocked his whole life, didn't he? Pretty much. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because uh, he was 73 years young, right? That's right. So, are you about the same age? I'm 75. Are you okay? Yeah. Well, awesome. <laughs> I think rock and roll is like a fountain of youth. <laughs> it is, definitely. <laughs> yeah, you know, Charlie Harper from the UK subs, I believe he's in his 80s now. <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. God bless him. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, always. Fingers and toes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, I've got a list of questions. Now, in America, paper lace... I had the one hit with the uh, the night Chicago died, which was a very big song here. Um, yeah. I was a big fan of that song when it came out in 1974. Now I have to ask: Had any of you in the band come to the actual state of Chicago before or during the before that song was recorded? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered <laughs> why, but the, the uh, geographical faux pas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Al Capone and all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you've, of course, played Chicago since then, right? No. Really? We, we've never worked the States. You know what? I did not know that. No. we've. Uh, I've been trying. I'm, I'm talking to somebody at the moment, but he he's um, very hopeful about what happens and, and, and couldn't believe that we'd never... We'd never toured the states or done the done the states in any way, shape, or form. Really, we'd have played Canada, but not uh, not the U.S. of A. I am so presumptuous, man. I just thought for sure you had. Wild. Yeah, absolutely. I bet that's something you've always wanted to do. You definitely, very definitely. Well, we'd love to have you. That's for sure. And now, in England and the U.K. and other places, you had several hits. Uh, of course, the Black Eyed Boys. Uh, the Night Chicago Died, and Billy Don't Be a Hero, which yep. was released over here in the States about four months before or after you guys did over there. Is that correct? After, yeah. Bob Odom. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Bono. What did you think of their version of the song? I didn't like it at all. <laughs> 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 I thought ours was uh, far superior. And yeah, that's there's actually been a couple of guys. I don't know what radio station, but a couple of guys did a did a sort of com comparison thing. They played both, both, and they they passed comment on it, and they deduced right at the end that uh, that our version was better. <laughs> well, that's great, man. Um, can I ask you why Paper Lace only did the two albums? Is there any reason you guys? I know you did some re-recordings and things. Did you decide just to do the two, and you were just happy with that, or what was the deal with that? No, we uh, we joined. We left our, our record company, uh, which was Bus Stop, 
and uh, we joined joined up with uh, EMI, and we did a bit of writing and we did a bit of recording, but uh, we never got past just one single release. Um, and then, then sort of as bands do, sort of in the uh, mid eighties. Uh, musical differences said that uh, we should part company, and uh, and that's what happened, really. And we both, yeah, I know. We, well, we all went off in different directions. Yeah, I know that uh, several of the guys had left the band. Uh, I believe it was nineteen seventy six. Yeah, seventy six. We got two new guys in. Um, yeah, Cliff and myself uh, got two new guys in. Peter Oliver from. The, he used to be with the New Seekers and uh, Jamie Moses, who is uh, quite a prolific um, guitarist nowadays. Works with speaking, well, speaking of guitarists, I've got to give a nice plug and shout out to uh, your very own Phil Hendricks, who's been yeah, on the yeah. show. And he's a legendary guitarist in his own right. He is very definitely, yeah, yeah. I um, yeah, the, the the meeting with him when. Um, Back in oh dear, when was it? He was he does um, he does some uh, uh, writing, you know, sort of uh, CD uh, information, and he does ah. that does that in his spare time and whatever. And um, he uh, he got in touch with me because he said, uh, could, "Would you mind if I asked you a few questions?" We hadn't met or anything. And he he said, uh, "I've been looking at your albums, and I really, I'm doing the uh, doing the stuff for the CD because you've got a double CD coming out in 2010, I think that was." And uh, I said, "Yeah, yeah, by all means, give me a ring." You know, he said, "I just want to get." He said, "I just want to get the story straight because I've read your album stuff, and it's very conflicting, sort of." things anyway um when uh, i think it was about a year later uh i joined facebook and uh it automatically sends out a friend uh request to anyone you've been in contact contact with or it did at that time and he uh, he got in touch and he said oh, what are you doing now and i said oh i'm clear for myself uh, i'm putting the band together we're looking for a guitarist and uh, he said oh i do a bit of that and uh, i said do you do vocals as well and he said yeah yeah no problem and i said oh we ought to meet up um if you're interested and i sort of his his place from my place is about two and a half hours drive so we met in the middle really a place called grantham and uh i chatted we chatted over several coffees for, in this coffee bar for for about three hours and um <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know about you, but I, I, I feel a, a sort of a, that I really get we get on and uh, I'd like you to join the band. And he said, uh, fine, you know, terrific. And I remember Cliff saying, um, I, said, I said to Cliff, I said, look, I found the guy, I found the, I found the guitarist, terrific guy, absolutely. And Cliff said, what does he play like? <laughs> and I said, I'm the foggy side. <laughs> I said, but you'll really like the guy. <laughs> <laughs> we have great conversation. <laughs> yeah. Just what we want. <laughs> <laughs> well, turns out you did the right thing, man, because that guy is so talented. I love his work that he's been oh. doing with Drew Osmond and his solo yeah. work. And of course, you're talking about the work he does doing like liner notes and things like that for like yeah. Cherry Red. And yeah. I read some, some of the stuff he did for the Bay City Rollers, of course. Yeah. Um, I have to ask, what was your opinion of the Bay City Rollers when those guys were coming up? I never liked them. I d they weren't they weren't a guys band, were they? They were they were they were a female attraction band. <laughs> you know, they were there for the girls, really. That was it. And um, I never I never liked their music, but Phil loves them to pieces. He's yeah. he sold on seventies Bay City Rollers. Yeah, you know, I, I have to admit it, I'm a fan as well. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, off of that subject, I just had to ask. Um, you know, all three of your hits that you guys had were written by two guys, and those two guys already also had their pen on other songs too like uh, for instance uh, Hitching a Ride. Yeah, yeah. yeah, There's so many songs. 
who in the heck were Mitch Murray and Peter Callender and why, and how they become so important in the paper lay story? They, uh, I mean, they were multimillionaires when we met them because they, they'd written all, do you remember Freddie and the Dreamers? Oh yeah. They wrote all their hits. Ah. The uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers. Oh yeah. They wrote several hits for them. They wrote, he, Tony Christie wrote everything but Amarillo. They wrote, because Amarillo was Neil Sedaka. But, yeah. uh, but they wrote the, the Ballad of Bonnie and Clyde. They wrote that for Georgia Fame. Oh, yeah. They wrote songs for Goodbye Sam, Hello Samantha, Cliff Richard. The, the list is endless, absolutely endless. And, and we, uh, we took part... Uh, we, we took part in an audition for a, a TV talent competition that was around at the time in 1970. We did this audition and um, we, we, we passed the audition. They asked to, us to do several songs and, and um, we thought, OK, we'll, we'll hear about this in a month's time. We'll be on TV. And um, three years later, we got this letter, 1973, <laughs> We got this letter to say, would you appear on the show? Uh, we, you know, we thought you were great at the audition. I thought, crack, it took you three years to make your mind up. And we, we actually thought at the time, do we really want this uh, at this point in our career? Because we'd, we'd made a few records, no hits, but we'd, we'd had a few releases. And, um, and then we looked at the viewing audience numbers, and it was, they, they were getting 7 million a week sort of view, viewing audience. For the listening audience now, um, that show was called Opportunity Knox. Yeah, and and we 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 appeared on that show, and uh, Connie, who was Peter Callender's wife, she was a big fan of Opportunity Knox, and she was watching it, and she saw us, and she knew that uh, Mitch and Pete had written this this song. And they were looking for someone and they were looking for maybe an established artist, you know, to give the song to. And she said, well, why don't you kick these boys off in, in their career? Why don't you give them the song and see what, what comes? And she says, I think they're really good. And, uh, and that was it, really. Our management got in touch with Mitch Murray and uh, the rest is history, as they say. Wow, that is a great story. I did not know some of that stuff. Yeah. That's interesting. And what a lot of people might not know is that you guys originally formed in 1967 as Music Box, That's doing right. like Beach Boys covers, things like that. Yep. Uh, you changed your name to Paper Lace in 1969. Yep. Um, of course, The Night Chicago Died was just, it's one of those songs that when we played on the radio show, everyone's like, oh, I love that song. I haven't heard it in so long. I love that one. And it's just got that great nostalgic feel here in the States. It's, it was a, it might have been just one hit, but everyone remembers it. You know, everyone knows that song. Yeah, know? there's, a, there's a radio station in, in Manhattan that uh, I get a, a sort of, um, <clears throat> you know, like a, a, there's a, a, some sort of performing rights thing. And I get a check from the States every three months. And the big payer is this radio station. I think it's called, I think it's called Sirius. Yeah, Sirius. Well, the, uh, Sirius FM. Yeah, or X, XM. Or, right, XM. Something like that. Yeah, in 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 Manhattan, and they are nice payers. <laughs> yeah, that's satellite radio. They're like the big guys. They run everything now. So wow. Yeah, see, I've been hosting this show for 23 years, and I'm I keep praying that somebody somewhere at some point will email me and offer me some gig on their satellite radio gig, you know, so I can oh, yeah. have the big checks. <laughs> um, we live in. Hope. 19... I'm sorry. <laughs> Pardon me. I said we live in hope. <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> um, in 1997. You joined uh, the band Sons and Lovers. Are you still with that band? No, no, no. Um, also, in nineteen or 2015, is that the year you joined the original Jukebox Heroes? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, of was, course. With, with, with Bill Hendricks. Yeah, Bill yeah. Hendricks is in the band. Uh, Dave Major. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. 
Uh, did the jukebox hero still play out? They do, yeah, but I'm not. I'm not a member anymore because there was one or two people left, and the ethos of that band was that uh, we all had a link with a, a, a different band in the seventies. There was one guy who, who took over from Noddy Holder in Slade. Oh yeah. And then there was Pete Phipps, who was the uh, uh, original Glitter Band drummer. And mm. there was Bill Hendricks, who'd appeared with Les McEwen. Dave Major had played with uh, T-Rex, uh, the music of Mark and Mickey. They, they were the, the sort of um, descendants from uh, Mark Bolan. Ah. Uh, and a guy called Jeff Brown, he was, uh, he was with Sweet, um, Andy Scott's Sweet, for a long time. And then there was myself uh, on Paper Lace. And, and we'd, all, we'd all got, and we, we only played those records that, that those particular bands had made, the hits. And then one or two people left, and it just didn't feel, it didn't feel the same. Okay, so you did your time, it was fun, then you left. Yeah, absolutely. Um, don't have much more time, but I'd like to ask you, uh, one of our listeners who's a big fan of yours, Karen Lee in Rhode Island, USA, wanted me to ask you if you have ever written or have ever thought about writing, writing an autobiography. Um, in the process of doing that. Are you? Yeah, at the moment. Yeah. I'm wow. About, that's awesome. I'm about 130 pages in and I've reached 1975. <laughs> well i tell you man i can't wait for that to come out because we're some voracious uh rock and roll biography reading people over here so we can't oh, wait to read that one. absolutely yeah that'd be great it's be right fun. from from it's my life story yeah completely oh, cool well earliest memory I can't wait for that. And can you let people know how they can reach you or how if they want to keep up with your musical stuff? Is there a website or a place people can go on social media, perhaps? Yeah, there's a, there's a website. It's uh, www.originalpaperlace.com. Originalpaperlace.com is the address. Yep. We are talking with Philip Wright, original singer and drummer for Paper Lace. It's been a pleasure, of course. Absolutely. We had we had a heck of a start earlier trying to figure out Skype and Zoom, but we finally went with Skype and it worked. <laughs> yeah, if only for the recording. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate it very much, my friend, and I'll be in touch about sending some vinyl your way to get autographed for my fanboy collection. <laughs> oh, do that. really, do that. Um, have you got my email? I will hit you up when we get done talking and privately, and I'll get that from you, okay. and I'll send that package out as soon as i can yeah terrific awesome well you know long live you long live uh, the original paper lace and uh god bless you man thank you thanks for having me <laughs>